ज्ञानाजनचलाखा चक्षुरून मिलिधाम जेना थस्मय श्री गुरवे नम I am very, very grateful and very honored to be with all of you today. Thank you for taking so much effort to come here to this distant place in the villages of India, which we have, we have named it Govardhan. Govardhan is the name of a mountain in Vrindavan, which is considered a most sacred place. Govardhan means one who nourishes the senses, the earth, the cows, and all living beings. Can you hear better? Rural communities are not famous for technological efficiency, <laughs> but we are trying. <laughs> I'd like to share a story because part of the art of living within this world is to open our hearts and our ears to what nature and God is teaching us at every moment. Sometimes things that appear to be very ordinary, everyday observances. And we have a tendency to just overlook it. If we're looking, if we're seeking wisdom, those events can transform our life. Years ago, I was sitting on the bank of the River Ganga. I was all alone. It was about noontime. It was the summer, so no one was around. As I was looking down into the beautiful, beautiful current, I happened to see over my head was a hawk, a very large hawk. His wings were expanded. They were brown, golden, white. I saw his eyes. They were a very shiny, piercing yellow color. He was intently looking for something. He was hovering in circles lower and lower and lower until he was only a few meters above my head. And I saw how sharp his pointed beak was and how sharp his claws were. And I was wondering what he might do. Came down lower and lower till he was almost right over me. Suddenly, he dove headlong right into the Ganga. There was a skirmish. Water was splashing. He went underwater. A few seconds later, he emerged from the river with a fish about one foot in length, flapping desperately. As he was going a little higher, they were just a few meters from me. And I looked in the eyes of that fish. He was in complete bewilderment. Flapping, flapping, and flapping. And as he flapped, the claws of the hawk 
like a vice went tighter and tighter. And as I was examining the eyes of this fish, I was thinking that perhaps he was just going about his day. Maybe it was a girl, I don't know. I can't tell the difference. Swamis don't make such discriminations. But just going about his day like any other day. Probably swimming with his family and his friends, a fish, sometimes going upstream, downstream, across stream, playing, looking for food. Had no conception that at the least expected moment, the hawk of destiny would rip him right out of the life he knew. And I was thinking, how much we are like that fish. We go about our life in our occupation, with our family, with our entertainment, whatever it may be, not knowing that this hawk of faith may be hovering right above us. We read about it in newspapers, we see it on television, we've experienced it in our own lives and in those who we love. Padam padam yad bipadam datesham. That no matter who we are, no matter what we have, the nature of this world is dukalaya mashashvata. There are innumerable uncertainties that can come upon us. But then I was thinking, if that fish was swimming deeper in the river, the hawk could never touch it. And similarly, we are so easily affected by all the dualities and all the endless possibilities of changes that may come in our life, if the substance of our values, the substance of our fulfillment is superficial, or let us say, shallow. And this is what dharma, this is what spirituality and religion is meant to give us. A deep experience of life, deep in the sense that we have a foundation that cannot be shaped, where we find a fulfillment that is beyond the ever-changing situations of this world. And Bhagavad Gita teaches us, when we act with great enthusiasm, determination, in this spirit, we become fearless, self-controlled, and compassionate. And then nothing that happens in this world can shake us. I was recently in England and I heard the words of a very famous Englishman, William Shakespeare. He said, if you lose your money, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. If you lose your values, you lose everything. <clears throat> In a cultured society, we learn to love people and use things. But in a society that has lost its culture and its values, the symptom is we love things and we use people to achieve them and to maintain them. One time Albert Einstein was speaking to another very, very famous physicist, scientist. And this scientist told Einstein his realization 
He said, in the Western world, we have produced an incredibly efficient, powerful ship or boat. But unfortunately, we do not have a compass. We do not have a compass. We're great at producing, but without a direction. What is the purpose of the ship? The, pur the purpose of a ship is not just to enjoy, it's to take us somewhere. Einstein also said that we cannot solve our present problems by using the same level of consciousness that caused those problems. <coughs> the greatest need in this world is a change of consciousness. There factually is enough of everything for everyone. If only we're compassionate for ourselves, our family, the people we work with, humanity, all living beings, and Mother Nature herself. That is the deficiency, the tendency to give up our values for something that is relatively cheap and cannot give real satisfaction. Martin Luther King, he said, the irony of our times is we have guided missiles and misguided men. We are endlessly being distracted by weapons of mass distraction. Human evolution, according to all the great philosophers throughout time, is to grow from the desperate need to get things to the satisfaction of giving and sharing. That what leaders do on every level of society, common people will follow. The leader of a family is the mother and father. The leader of business, the leader in politics, the leader in education, the leaders in agriculture. someone's house in America last summer. And there was this little girl who had all sorts of beautiful dress and ornaments and she had every possible thing to play with. But she was miserable. Because her parents didn't have time to give her love. They were so busy, they just gave her things occupied while they did what they felt they had to do. She was pretty, she was beautiful, but she was miserable because all she really wanted is to love and to be loved. That's the very nature of happiness. Things, things can give some temporary satisfaction to the mind and to the senses. But things cannot touch the heart. And real fulfillment of love is a thing of the heart. There are only two things that touch the heart. To love and to be loved. The Brahma Sutra tells 
means that every living being has something in common. That essentially we are all looking for pleasure. From the insect, the bird in the sky, the fish in the water, the animals in the forest, and every sector of human beings, rich, poor, black, white, red, yellow, brown, male, female, everyone is looking for pleasure. And everyone is trying to avoid pain because pain interrupts pleasure. The Brahma Sutra tells us why we have this in common. Because essentially the living force within every living being is spiritual. that is seen through our eyes, hearing through our ears, tasting through our tongues, smelling through our nose, feeling through our flesh, thinking through our brains, loving through our hearts. Who is that? That witness. Who is that person without a living, beautiful body? Is a corpse that is either buried in the ground or burned by fire and swept into a river. What is the difference between a living body and a dead body? My Guru Dev Shiva Prabhupada, he was once speaking at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was appreciating the high level of study that they were being the given the opportunity to access. Explain how there needs to be a foundation of knowledge in which we build upon with our knowledge, with our skills, with our technologies, with our lives. To understand that we are not just these bodies, the bodies are the car. You're like the driver. We see through the windshield. We press the horn. We push the accelerator. No. Just because you're not the car, it doesn't mean you neglect the car. You take proper care of the car. You give it its tune ups, you give it its fuel. You take as excellent care as it is possible so that the automobile can serve its purpose. gasoline in the car, it's nourish. <coughs> but if the driver drinks gasoline, it's not going to be satisfied. <laughs> but that's what civilization has come to. We're thinking that what is good for the body is good for the soul. We should do what's good for the body.
Arjuna was motivated by a spirit of selfless service. Without greed, arrogance, or envy. So some people think if you become too religious, you're, you're going to lose your potency and your will to succeed. But was Arjuna less motivated than Duryodhana? Absolutely not. He was even more motivated than Duryodhana because love is a much greater power than greed. In this world, an example is a mother. A mother loves her child. She doesn't have a time card, nine to five, and then she does whatever she likes. She's on 24-hour call, and sometimes she's working 24 hours. Sometimes all night long. But to speak of the labor of having the child. Because there's love. This is what gave the teachers. How to be dynamic, how to be fearless, with a focus. Understand our own self, 
then we can understand our relationship with everyone else on a spiritual level. Aham Bija Pradapita. Krishna tells that I'm the seed giving father and mother of all living beings. When we understand that, there's real love. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur, whom I very, very honored friend, Mr. Mahabal cited. This man had ten children. He was a high court advocate during the British time in India and Bengal. He wrote so many books. He sang the songs every day. His wife was qualified just like him. He explained the testimony of somebody who loves God is natural compassion toward all living things. And this great treasure is within all of us. But our tendency is to get swept away by temptation by anxieties, by aspirations. In order to really have a stable, productive quality of life, we require a strong foundation. This building, all the bricks were made from the earth of our land. Fired, but they were pressed. In fact, I made some of the bricks myself. If you like, you can also make bricks from here. <laughs> we, just, we just condense it and then let it dry in the sun. And it's a traditional method where these bricks could last for hundreds of years. So there's a nice sound system, nice. Curtains. They have in the future nice paintings. How many people have ever come to your home and said, This house has a wonderful foundation? Have you ever had that experience? But yet, everything that they're complimenting you for is being sustained by the foundation. Foundation crumbles, everything collapses. What is the foundation that gives us a quality life? It's based on truth. Krishna tells in Gita, Nashitoviteva. Truth is that which does not change. That's our foundation. We are eternal souls. The Atma within us is forever. We're divine. We're a part of God. And our nature is to love and to serve. There's a traditional analogy in India of a good dog It's parallel to the teachings of Gita. Krishna tells we have a divine nature and we have a demoniac nature, every one of us. This good dog is the propensities that we have to be arrogant, violent, angry, lusty, envious, greedy, full illusion. That's the bad dog. And the good dog, our divine nature, has the qualities of humility, compassion, wisdom, contentment, not 
contentment that makes us lazy, but contentment that drives us to be motivated with a real purpose for good. And these two dogs are always fighting. That's the greatest need in the world. 
leaders who have this type of integrity. And ultimately, the foundation to live in that integrity is inner fulfillment. May I tell you another animal story? My father, he, he's been in India for the last few weeks. He's 89 years old. He's just leaving today back for Chicago, where I was born and raised. The first time they came to India, how they came was interesting. Because in America, it's probably getting like this in India. It's really difficult, especially in the 1960s in America, to have nice dialogue with your parents. My mother and father were such loving, sweet, caring people. And I'd come home at night and they'd say, please, son, tell us what did you do? And I would say, why do you want to know? Why do you always interfere with my life? That's the way teenagers do it. I was like that. Anyways, I came all the way to India. And Jane, when I came back home, I was really a different I left America as a college student on a summer break for a summer vacation to Europe, which was supposed to be two and a half months. And I came back years later as a hardcore sadhu, <laughs> wearing sadhu robes. I had long matted hair. I all, my, they were expecting me. And my father and brother picked me up at the airport, finally me after years. Where was your baggage? And I showed them my little begging ball. I said, this is my bag. And they understood something is different here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, in 1989, they met Mr. Desai. He's with us. He's with us. And they asked him, what does our son do? He never tells us. And he said, you have to come to India to find out. So they came. It was incredible, my mother and my father. Just by being with the people of India, people who had values, people who had non-judgmental, compassionate, spiritual foundations. They never met anybody like that. If you go into my father's office, he's retired now, he had dozens and dozens and dozens of photographs and frames with many of the most famous politicians and entertainers and athletes. And everybody knows. And he had so many friends. But he and my mother said, we have never met people with such love, with such goodness as the people of India. They were crying every night because they were so proud. I remember my father, when he was here, there was a Business Week magazine, the Indian edition, and it had a picture of Arabin Mafakal and Rishikesh Mafakal on the cover. And it said, The Conscience of India's Industry. My father saw that, and he was meeting them. He's living in a beautiful house with my mother. Can I see your business? Because my father considered himself a very successful businessman. This was in 1989, before all this reorganization happened. And they were always kind of ashamed of me. I'll give you a little example. Last year, I spoke at the HSBC Bank, and there was 900 bankers who came to my talk. And I I just looked out of them. I had to smile. And I began my talk by just revealing my heart. I'm so grateful that you let me be here with you. You are among the greatest bankers in the world, working for one of the greatest banks in the world, and you're asking me to speak to you. And to be honest, I have not had a bank account or signed a single check since 1969. They looked at me like I was an alien from a distant universe. So you can imagine a father. They had nothing, no property, no money. They were the same fashion. 
shape that we did. When he came to India, we were the Muffet Bellhops. And I remember Muffet Bell and my father exactly the same age. I remember Muffet Bell said to my father, after my father saw just one of their textile plants, a whole city black bit with all these machines, hundreds of these machines made in Europe, $60,000 each machine, thousands and thousands of workers. He went into his office building and that night we were having dinner together. And Mr. Mafalao said to my father, we are small people, but your son is great. That was culture shock for my father. He said, you are saying my son is great. He doesn't have anything. You have so much. said, having all this stuff is not great. Living a life that God's values is great. Now, I'm not saying I'm like that, because I know my own weaknesses and everything else. But just that appreciation of what real values and real greatness is completely changed my mother and father's. So one day we decided to take them sightseeing. So the person who was moderating this wonderful event, Rajesh, he took my mother, my father, and myself on a boat to Elephanta. Yeah. <laughs> 
1989, the bureaucracy of India, trying to get new passports, trying to get new visas, trying to get new airline tickets, trying to get credit cards, you know, canceled and reissued, and what to speak of all the money that's gone forever. Everything. Was, they were in total distress. But among you was very happy. Mm -hmm. The nature of the world. One person's food is another person's poison. So they looked at me and said, what are you going to do?
back to America some months later. Everyone, all relatives, friends, and everyone who was acquainted with my parents, my brothers, they were all telling me how all they talk about is how you outwitted a monster. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually worked out really well. Sometimes crises are opportunities to accomplish something wonderful. Do you remember that incident? spiritual foundation. We understand the lesson of this book. How do we give up our tendencies toward corruption, our tendencies toward envy and greed and arrogance? The mind is like a
each of them, what is the most fulfilling accomplishment that you had in your life? And before asking Joe Torrey this, in the video show, Joe Torrey was a Hall of Fame baseball player. And he's historically one of the greatest in history. And then he was made, when he got a little older, into a manager. And the New York Yankees were in the biggest slump in their history. They were really doing miserable. Ten years went by, they didn't make a single playoff. So the owner of the New York Yankees hired Joe Torrey to be the new manager. And all the press in New York and all the people in New York were outraged. The television, the radio, the newspapers, the magazines were saying this is the biggest mistake. They're destroying our team. Joe Torrey is a useless person. He has no capacity to lead. And he took the job. And in the next 10 years, and Joe Torrey. They were in six World Series and they won four. And he was voted as one of the top five baseball managers in history. Now, why is this why we talk about this? Even I don't know, but I'm going to say it anyway. They asked him, what was the most fulfilling accomplishment? Said, compared to this lady who cures people of cancer, I haven't done anything. Mike Wilkins said, Well, you may say that, but a lot of us here are New York Yankees fans, and we feel that you have done tremendous things. And he asked, How many of the 2,500 people there were New York Yankee fans? Over half of them raised their hands. said, the most fulfilling accomplishment of my life. He said, let me explain. He said, do you know why I became such a good baseball player? He said, I was from the inner city of New York. And my father was alcoholic, violent, and abusive. Terrorized his mother. There was nothing but Screaming, beating, and terror when he was home. Just as a little boy. He said he suffered so bad. The only thing he could do to escape the sufferings and release all the anguish within him was play baseball. He said, I so intensely, I was taking shelter of baseball. It helped me forget my sufferings at home. And it helped me release when I hit that ball of my anger and all my frustration and all my disappointment. He said, I felt at home totally useless. I had no value whatsoever. Do you know what it's like for a little boy to have no love? To feel that he's just a disturbance? He said, that's how I became such a great baseball player. He said, the most fulfilling thing I did in my life is not being Hall of Fame champion. It's not by being a great base baseball manager and being like the king of New York City for 10 years. The greatest accomplishment is I established in inner city schools a foundation to help children We put psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors in these schools. And these little children who felt useless, deprived, depressed, and fearful, just like me, they are given a sense of their value. They are given a sense of morality. They are treated and they are given a future. And when I see those children smile, by far, that is the greatest fulfillment of my life. He got a standing ovation. I was looking around. There were CEOs of biggest banks. There were
presidents of biggest corporations, there were presidents of universities, there was governors and senators. They were all crying and clapping. They didn't do that for any of the other stuff that was being discussed. And I was thinking, whoever we are, it's that compassion that actually reaches people's hearts. Mr. Ruffalo was saying when his father passed away, it wasn't that he was just a great business leader of industry. People actually loved him because of something that was beyond the business. Yes, he worked like a soldier in his business, but his compassion, his values, And after he got the standing ovation, you know what he said? He said, actually, this whole foundation I'm telling you about, it was all my wife's idea. It wasn't my idea. I'm just assisting her. That's quite humble for a man to say that in front of all these people. Now, this is a relative thing. But it does give us a sense what really is a value in life. Is it giving or taking? I have never seen anyone with inner fulfillment, no matter how high they climb on the ladder or whatever their field may be, or how much money they get. Mind, you know, there's some satisfaction. But fulfillment comes through. And whoever and wherever we are, the higher we are, the more we can set that example for the world. According to the Gita, the more we accomplish, the higher our position, the more we acquire, the greater our responsibility. This really fascinated me. During that leadership conference, the person who was quoted more than anyone else in the history of the world was Mahatma Gandhi. Steve Wynn, he quoted Gandhi three times. Oh, 
don't think everyone is looking for. The very end of the conference, stupid, he said, my motto in business is the words of Mahatma Gandhi. There go my people. Swamiji, why have you come to our country? He said something that really struck me and it makes me so proud too. Shri Prabhupada said, for about two centuries the British controlled India. And you exploited as much as you could of the wealth and the treasures of India and brought it to England.
India is becoming a global power in industry, in economics, in technology, and in so many other fields. What the world needs the most from India is not only our gadgets, not only our wisdom in engineering and technology and science, that's all important, but India can give a foundation of wisdom and values. Prabhupada said, you took from India all its treasures and brought it to England, but you forgot one. Its spiritual culture and values. He said, I have come to England to give you what you forgot to take. This is our responsibility. Swamis, our fathers, our engineers, our scientists, our business 